You're looking now at a live shot of Boston. A uh, large crowd gathering as protesters once again make their voices heard. Peaceful as we speak, but um, I should mention Washington, though, uh, at least um, where we viewed uh, the president's address was anything but last night. That after demonstrators were hit with rubber bullets and tear gas. Take a listen to part of what the president had to say why that was happening. If a city or state refuses to take the actions that are necessary to defend the life and property of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. Now, forget for the moment uh, whether or not the president even has the authority to do what he just threatened. In this segment, we're going to discuss that slippery slope that we're on, where a commander-in-chief threatens to deploy U.S. military on American soil. CNN reporting that some of the top brass in the Pentagon firmly against the idea as they want local law enforcement and the National Guard to handle the situation instead. Plus, many people upset that the president trotted out military leaders during his walk to the church last night. Retired four-star General Barry McCaffrey sent a tweet saying, Trump, a threat to democracy, and these are very dangerous times, he warned. Former CIA Director Michael Hayden, he says he was appalled to see the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff walk over to the church by Trump. I want to bring in our guest to discuss, retired Lieutenant General Russell Honore. He was the commander of Joint Task Force Katrina. Also, he led the Pentagon's efforts during several other disasters and emergencies. General, thank you, A, for your time and your service. But when people look at you, they remember you um, as a person who brought not just order, but, you know, solved the bottleneck that we had uh, in Orleans after uh, Katrina. What they're talking about bringing the military here isn't necessarily a rescue mission, People say it felt last night like they were watching some, you know, wannabe dictator in some Latin American countries, you know, strong arming a situation. It just felt and looked really wrong. Yeah, this White House has a tendency to be working on the wrong problems. Um, I don't think uh, uh, the intent of what they were trying to do was well understood by the military. Uh, I do think uh, we've got to protect our federal property in D.C., and that's always been done well by the federal services and with the backup from the D.C. Guard. Uh, what the president is talking about, he doesn't have the authority to do. He cannot force active duty troops into a state unless the governor asks for it, particularly when it comes to uh, dealing with civil disturbance. So again, he's given an order he don't, he can't do. It sounds great, it sounds macho, but he either doesn't understand the Constitution and the law or he don't give a damn. I hadn't figured out which one. If it's ignorance or stupidity. Well, what do you think when you hear your president saying things, you know, first comes looting, then comes the shooting, then he talks about uh, the vicious dogs and breaking out ominous weapons, weapons, taking back the night and dominating protesters. Again, these are Americans we're talking about here. Uh, it, I don't know, it took a lot of people back to the 60s. Yeah, I mean, it's a level of stupidity. It's the same people he's trying to get the vote for him. This is <laughs> crazy. Uh, but that being said, I think with the intervention of the Senate and the House and the lawyers uh, have got time to look at what he want to do, uh, they may bring some troops up to the D.C. area. Uh, we can't let people go trash the White House. So the protesters just need to understand that. You will not get to go trash federal buildings. And, and much of that land inside of D.C. is controlled by the federal government. So you, we can make all the statements. I'm a big proponent of uh, uh, exercising our First Amendment right. I did it myself when I was in college. But we, you can't go in and trash federal buildings to make your statement. And by and large, most of the protests have been pretty peaceful. But that one-off by going in and going through a police station and burning it down, that, that will not work. That, that's, a, that's a bad scene. And I hope uh, the peaceful protesters uh, will make their protests a daylight operation. When they get dark, go home. Go work on getting people to vote. Because the bad stuff is happening at night 
that's when the looters are coming in and the uh, the provocateurs, and they're escalating the violence. So most of the daytime demonstrations are working good. The statement is being made. We've got uh, demonstrations almost in every state. Uh, let's do our work in the daytime, and let's separate yourself from the provocateurs. Well, when you're ready to talk, take a knee, or sit down. Dr. King and Gandhi were great at that. And that's where you do your civil disobedience. You, you go to a piece of ground and you sit there and uh, you get hauled off and the next day they let you out. But uh, I would say we've got to uh, help the police control the violence and the police have to work with the pro uh, protesters. They should be there to protect the protesters and not to beat them up. Um, uh, I don't know why, but some mayors have been resistant uh, to the idea of the National Guard. I, I you know, I, I certainly think like you, you need to have um, some law and order in the evening when sometimes these provocateurs have taken over. But explain, if you could, General, for our audience, why the General McCaffrey's of the world, uh, the, we're hearing folks at DOD are uncomfortable. When people say, well, what's the difference between the National Guard and the U.S. military? There's a distinction with the difference, especially when you're talking about an American soil. Talk about when they talk about bringing troops here. Forget if he has the right to or not. Even trying to do that concerns a lot of people, especially in military. Well, absolutely. The National Guard works for the governor. They do not work for the president. We've had a few times in history where he's federalized the National Guard. And every time we send them to Iraq or Afghanistan or someplace, we federalize them for those missions. But by and large, the National Guard is the providence of the governor. But I said something was going downhill, uh, I think it was Sunday, when the governor of uh, Minnesota said he had been in a conversation with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That, that's a conversation that should very seldom ever happen. Normally, under missions like this, that governor should have been talking to the Secretary of Homeland Security, not the Secretary of Defense uh, and the chairman. I think they got pulled into this by the White House because I think the president think he's uh, President Lincoln, and I think he think the chairman is going to be his grant. That won't work. That will not work. And uh, he's trying to replay a movie that did not end well. That is not going to work. Uh, and the chairman and the secretary of defense uh, was kind of complicit in going in and giving governors advice in how to tactically deploy the National Guard. Well, that pissed off every National Guard general in the Army. We have an adjutant general assigned to every governor who runs the National Guard. And to hear the chairman and the secretary of defense giving the governor advice on how to use the National Guard. That, that's pretty That's pretty weird. Yeah, just a weird scene yesterday also, seeing the um, Attorney General, um, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Defense Secretary, and I guess the first family walking over to a church that they just cleared out a crowd with tear gas. Uh, you know, the whole thing just, it just didn't feel right. But General, as always, I appreciate you making some time for us. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think everything will be all right. This too will pass. Let's hope the general is right. Um, when we come back, the police perspective. What are officers on the streets thinking as they head out tonight? How do they handle the anger, the violence, and the looting they could encounter? Um, after we come back, we'll get the perspective. It's from an African-American retired NYP detective. He'll give us his take.